Good morning. It's good to be here. Glad you're here. Glad our streaming crowd is joining us. And you know, um, I mentioned last week that last Saturday or last Friday, Cody and Lauren got married. And uh, I just wanted us to have a chance to uh, congratulate them personally. So if you see them, offer your congratulations to them, and we're awful proud of them. And they were just all down south on their honeymoon, got back yesterday. So is that right? Did you get back yesterday? Friday. Oh, you got back Friday. And you never called me. All right. <laughs> great. Thanks, you guys. We're happy for you. It's a great celebration. So, but... You heard Dave Roberts say that we believe God's doing something great in the midst of our church. And uh, one of the things that happened this week, one of these signs of uh, the Holy Spirit working in a powerful way is at Young Adult Group on Tuesday night, four young adults were baptized uh, Tuesday night at Young Adult Group. So how exciting that is. If you're a young adult and you're, uh, you're not connected to the uh, Young Adult Group, you ought to come out on Tuesday night. You ought to get connected it's a festive group and a lot of fun, a lot of great dialogue, a lot of uh, tremendous community that's happening in that group. So plan on being a part of that. So have you ever asked, did you ever ask yourself, or perhaps you've ever maybe felt this way, God, are you there? Do you even exist? I mean, have you, you ever felt that way? You ever felt like I'm alone? I'm alone in my problems, and, and maybe I'm just alone in the universe. I, I don't know. God, why can't I see you, or, or, or why can't I hear you? You know, one of the things I love about our passage of Scripture this morning is that it addresses that issue. And Jesus talks about how the very rocks, the very rocks of creation itself become a stepping stone for us to get to God. That the rocks that surround us can remove doubt and create certainty in our lives. And our passage of scripture is this. You're, you're familiar with it. In Luke chapter 19, it says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Well, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day that would bring peace, that what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds to what it is that, uh, that you shared in these moments of the triumphal entry. Uh, speak to us at the point of our need and open the eyes of our heart for understanding. We love you, Lord. We praise you. In your name, amen. So you notice in this passage of Scripture that there are those that are celebrating Jesus, right? Those that believe, they've seen the miracles, and then you have those that are agitated at the celebration of Jesus. They just don't believe in spite of seeing the miracles. Right, some in this passage of scripture, they're waving palm branches, they're taking their coats off and they're throwing it before the coal. They're, they're shouting their praises out loudly. And then there are others that are saying, can't you get them to stop? They need to stop. And, and when the crowd that said they need to stop, the, the unbelieving crowd, the crowd that although they saw did not see, 
Jesus invokes creation itself to explain the radical praise that they're experiencing. And he does it in verse 40 of our chapter. He says this, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. Like if they remain silent, the stones all around you will cry out. They will sing and they will rejoice and they will shout. Now, you know, one of the interesting things that Jesus is informing these doubting Pharisees about is he's informing them that the people's response to him is a natural response. It is natural for creation to recognize its creator. Now, you know the definition of a natural response, right? I mean, the technical definition is this. It refers to an automatic reaction in response to a specific stimulus without any prior learning or conditioning, right? You don't have to learn it. You don't have to be conditioned in it. You just do it. It's like the knee jerk. You've ever been in the doctor's office and he checks, checks your reflexes and he takes his little hammer out and he smacks it up against that tendon in your knee. And what happens? Nobody trained you to do this. Nobody told you you were supposed to do this. But when he hits that hammer on your knee, automatically your foot, your foot raises. Boom, it just responds to it. It's a natural response. So in one sense, Jesus is saying this, for you not to respond this way to me, you have to be broken or you have to fight against it intentionally. Now, the reality is, is right, Jesus enters a broken world, a world where people do not recognize God. They don't recognize God in the flesh. Uh, they're, 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 they were designed originally at the original creation to point up towards him and to point out towards other, but at the fall, they were broken. And they point down into themselves and in from others. But creation itself, the rocks and the stones, they recognize their creator. In, in fact, you know, Jesus says this at this passage of scripture, but you know, all throughout the scripture, it speaks how creation recognizes God's constant presence and cries out. I mean, creation isn't waiting for you to be silent to cry out. The scripture says creation cries out now all around us. Isaiah 55 verse 12 says this, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Like if you ever doubt or you ever say, I'm not sure, or you never, all you have to do is look out your window at the trees that are clapping their hands to the presence of, of God. Paul, Paul says this in Romans chapter one, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities. So you see the scripture recognizes that it points, you know, there's an invisibility, right? God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature, right? They're invisible, right? That's what the scripture's saying. Then it says, has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. What has been created? Man, God's eternal power and, 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 and his divine nature is seen in what has been made. So that, Paul goes on to write, People are without excuse. Now, now, you know, there's been throughout history so many different arguments uh, about the existence of God that flow out of creation. And you're familiar with these arguments, right? I mean, if you've, if you've gone to college or you've been, right, they, in, in philosophy class, they, they talk about all these sort of things. They talk about the teleological argument, which is the argument of intelligent design. If there's intelligent design, then that means there's an intelligent designer. I mean, obviously, uh, the cosmological argument is the argument of first cause. Like, who created all of this? Who initiated all of this to begin and to be in place? There had to be somebody who initiated all of this that points to God. I mean, creation itself, right? The, 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 the stones that cry out, the trees that clap their hands, the mountains that shout, creation itself becomes a stepping stone for us to draw closer to God. And there's other arguments. I mean, there's other arguments about the existence of God. The axiological argument, right? The argument of judgment. If you can make a judgment, if you have a basis to decide what is right and what is wrong, that has to come from somewhere. 
Like, like let me ask you this. Have you ever, did you ever hear the, the argument of the problem of evil? A lot of folks use the argument of the problem of evil to, to kind of argue against the existence of God. But you know, actually, the problem of evil argues for the existence of God. So here's the way the problem of evil goes. Hey, uh, uh, how can there be a God, how can there be a good God and a loving God if evil exists in our world, right? So the argument is there's evil, so therefore God is not in existence, or at least he's not loving. That's the argument. Now think about that for a second. Because the argument goes the other way with great force. So, right, the response to the problem of evil is this. So, you believe there is a standard of evil, right? Because you're saying evil exists. But yes, evil exists. It's obvious evil exists. You're right, it's obvious. So, how do you know it's evil? Well, what do you mean, how do I know it's evil? Because it's wrong. Wait a minute. If you can declare something is wrong, then you must be able to declare something is right. So just like there is universal evil, there then must be universal good. Well, where did that come from? Where did the idea of universal good come from? And where did this idea that, yes, there is a way we ought to live, yes, there is a way we ought to treat each other, where did all of this come from, right? If there's a code by which you should live, who created the code? And how did all of us come to this place to where we understand it? I mean, the reality is if there's a code by which we understand what is good, therefore we understand what is evil, then obviously there is a common thread that runs through all of creation that is good. And it comes from our good God. You see, the problem of evil isn't found in God. The problem of evil is found in man. Just because humanity is broken and humanity rejects God doesn't necessarily mean that it is God's problem although he works adamantly to help correct that in us. But, but you know, one of the things that's interesting that Paul says, and, and we have to think this way, right? We have to think this way about even creation itself and the rocks that exist and all the things that are around us. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. That's what we do. Why right? we look and say, wait a minute, there's, there's an obvious knowledge of God that exists in the rocks themselves. It's a, there's an there's a obvious knowledge of God. And we set ourselves up to say anyone who says that there is no knowledge of God, well, that's, that's just simply not true. And it says we take captive every thought, all of our thoughts to make it obedient to Christ. And creation itself helps us. Creation helps us in this. The argument for God is weaved into creation itself. And, and, and you know, and, and that, that, that helps us some, right? When, when, when we have these intellectual or these philosophical thoughts of, of debate in our mind, it helps us to say, all I have to do is look at my window and recognize that, man, God is, is present. And creation displays that. But oftentimes, you know, our issue with God isn't, does he exist, right? Sometimes that's the issue. But oftentimes the issue is, is does he even care? Does God care? Well, creation itself shouts that God cares. In fact, in this passage of scripture, both of those issues are, are like addressed, right? The first issue, when he says, man, the rocks are gonna cry out, there's a natural response, right? The, the creation knows its creator. There's a natural response and we have to be broken or we have to fight against it not to respond that way because it's a natural response of the created to respond to the creator. But, but we even see in this passage of scripture, Jesus's deep care is displayed. In verse 41, right after he says, the rocks cry out. Here's the next thing we read. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city he wept over it. Like, I mean, Jerusalem, right? He's at the top of the Mount of Olives and he's looking down at this great city, the holy city, and he is weeping over it. I mean, it's not just a surface emotion. It's a, it's a deep felt disturbance in his soul when he looks at Jerusalem. I mean, Jesus cares 
And I mean, it's obvious in the scripture how, how deeply he cares. Jesus looks at this great city and his heart is broken. And you know why that is. Because he states in this passage of scripture why his heart is broken for Jerusalem. He says this in verse 42. If you, speaking to the city, right, as a whole, even you, and you know why he says even you, because you're Jerusalem, you're the holy city, right? You're Zion. You're like, if anybody should know, you should know. Jerusalem should know. But he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Now think about this. Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. He's weeping over the people of Jerusalem because they have no peace. They're not at peace. I mean, they're living in chaos. They, they think chaotically. Turmoil dominates their lives. They don't even know what he says. They don't even know what could bring them peace. They don't recognize it. Their lives are full of worry and their lives are full of anxiety and their lives are full of stress. Confusion dominates. It's just the condition of broken creatures. And this breaks Jesus' heart. I mean, Jesus cares, is, right? I mean, I mean, God caring is all through the scriptures. Right? It's not hard to, 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 to go to the scriptures and, and see the activity of God that's stated for us that displays how deeply he cares. Right? Psalms 56, 8, we talked about this a few times. You number my wanderings. Wherever I drift to, you know, you number them. You're keeping track of them. You put my tears in a bottle. Like every, every tear I cry, it, it matters to you. You put it in a bottle. Are they not in your book? Do you not keep a record of me? Because of your great care and because of your great concern. Man, what I'm worried about, what I'm anxious about, and what I cry over, you cry over. And you know, you know them intimately. Isaiah chapter 46, think about this. Not only when we're crying, listen to this. Even to your old age, the prophet writes, and gray hairs, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Now think about that thought. Right? Even as you get old, even as you age, right? Even as perhaps you begin to feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm as important as I used to be or I'm as relevant as I was or, 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 or other people think of me as often as they do. God says, hey, I do. I've got you. It doesn't matter how, how gray your hair becomes or if you even have hair at a certain age. I've got you. I have not forgotten you. And then I love what Peter writes in first seven in, in, in chapter one, uh, or first Peter chapter five, verse seven. Think about this phrase: cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Anxieties. Cast all your anxieties on him. I, you know something I realize about myself when it comes to anxieties? Most of the things that I'm anxious about hasn't even happened yet. Have you noticed that in your life? You get stressed out, you get worried, you get anxious, and it hasn't even happened yet. Like the negative that, that you're filling yourself up with and, and the worries that you have, they haven't even come into existence yet. They're all in pretend land. They're not even real yet. But that doesn't matter, right? God doesn't say, hey, you know, those aren't even real. Quit acting like they're real. Those aren't even real. You know what he says? Give those to me too. You're worried about it? I don't care if it's pretend. I don't care if it exists somewhere that's not reality. Give me those too. Cast those on me. Now, you know why Jesus wants us to turn our worries over to him. Do you know why that is? He says it, he says it very clearly. In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, listen to what he says worry does to us. The worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth. You know why he attaches the deceitfulness of wealth to worries? Because at least where we live, we tend to worry about that a lot. We tend to worry about wealth. 
how much do I have? How much do I, do I have saved? Am I going to be able to make it? Am I going to be able to pay the bills? Am I going to be able to get what I want? Am I going to be able to take the vacation that I feel like I deserve? Are my kids going to be able to wear name brand stuff? Because, you know, I want them to be as popular as everybody else in school. The deceitfulness of wealth is attached to something that creates this worry and concern in us. And the desires for other things, listen to what happens. This is why he doesn't want us to worry and be anxious. And the desires for those other things come in and they choke the word, making it unfruitful. So he's like, look, I, cast your anxieties on me. I don't want you to be worried because what happens when you get all worried and you get all worked up, the word of God loses its activity in your life. Because you're thinking about all these things. You're worried about all these things. These become your goal. And no longer is the word of God being active in your life, the goal of your life. And, and you become unfruitful. He even says in Matthew 6, the pagans live like that. That's what he says in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, he says, look, man, if you're living that way, filled up with all those sort of things, you, you, you're living like I don't exist. You're living like I don't care. You're living like a pagan when you live like this. Now, now, of course, I know somebody says, how do I stop worrying, right? I mean, you know, when you talk about a natural response, right? Worrying is a natural response. How do I stop worrying? Well, you know, you can't stop worrying by uh, gritting your teeth and saying, I'm not going to worry anymore. I'm not going to worry anymore. I'm not going to worry anymore. Because then you start worrying about worrying, Right? Man, I'm worrying about how much I worry. I worry too much. That, 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 that stresses me out, makes me anxious. No, you can't stop worrying by, you know, gritting your teeth and saying, I'm not going to worry anymore. Jesus tells us, you have to think about something different. And he tells us specifically what to think about, right? I mean, in his whole scripture, his whole message on worry in Matthew chapter 6, he says this, seek first his kingdom. That's what he says after his whole discussion on worry. He's like, listen, you don't worry. It's not going to add a day to your life. It's not going to do this or that. Worrying does you nothing. You know what you ought to do? You ought to seek first his kingdom. Focus on that. Think about that. Right? Make that the dominant thing. You can't stop worrying by, 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 by like grit your teeth. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to worry. No, you start thinking about something different. Start thinking about the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be given. All these other things will be taken care of on their own. So Jesus looks down onto this city, right? He's looking down onto Jerusalem and his heart is broken over all of these things. He's looking at Jerusalem and he's going, you're lost. You're wayward. You're full of worry and you're full of anxiety and you're sucked in by the deceitfulness of wealth and, and, and you don't have focus and, and you don't have understanding. You don't have insight. You can't see. And, and in fact, that's the one very clear uh, concern that Jesus has that, that really breaks his heart is he says, you don't catch the weightiness of this moment. Like, like have you ever... You used that phrase before, the, the weight of this moment. Like, there are powerful moments in our lives. And all sorts of powerful moments. Right? A few weeks ago, we celebrated graduation. Graduation's a powerful moment. Right? There's an accomplishment that we celebrate, but there's also a transition in life at graduation. There's important decisions that need to be made at graduation. If you're in high school, it's like, hey, where am I going to go to college? And what's my next step? If you're graduating from college, it's like, where am I going to work? Right? I mean, I mean, hey, we just, we just brought Cody and Lauren up. You talk about a weighty moment, right? A week ago Friday, that's a weighty moment. Like that day in Valley Forge Park when, when Cody bent a knee and opened up the little case and showed her the ring and said, marry me, that is a weighty moment because it is going to change the rest of his life. Right, I mean, there's weight to that. You get it. When you stand up in front of that altar before God, you understand the weight of that moment or, or when a child is born. Man, you have a baby and it's like, whew. Man, I remember when my first child was born and, and I held him and I was like, I will do whatever it takes 
to take care of you. Like the weight of that moment, right? It, it does something to us. There's an impact of the weightiness of that moment because there's life-altering decisions attached to the weight of the moments. And, and, and sometimes you don't, you don't get those moments back. Like in this case, in the scripture, when God shows up, there's a weight to that moment. There is a weightiness to this moment when we realize that God has always been with us. There's a weightiness to that moment that, that changes our lives. But, but in verse 44, listen to what Jesus says, right? When he talks about you don't get the weightiness of the moment. In verse 44, he says, Man, you know, I'm, 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 I'm so concerned for you and I'm, and I'm weeping over you and I, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What breaks his heart more than anything? You don't recognize I've come. Like I'm right here. I'm, 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 I'm about ready to walk into the city. And here the Pharisees are saying, can you get them to stop? This is inappropriate. This isn't okay. Can you shut this down? This feels awkward to me and it feels out of place. Is there anything? And he's like, oh, man, my heart is broken. You don't understand the time of God's coming to you. Now, now it's so interesting sometimes the way we read the scripture. Because a lot of times, if we would read this scripture, we're sitting at home, we're reading this scripture on our own, we come upon, you do not recognize the time of God's coming. And you know where almost all of our minds go to immediately? I mean, this is true. I mean, this is where it goes to, in the time of God's coming. Most people see that as, uh, as the end of time. They, they, they see it as uh, judgment and destruction. God's coming. How many of you heard this? Hey, Jesus is coming. Look busy. Don't, don't be caught unaware. He's coming. You better make sure at least you're looking to part if you're not. We, we attach it to wrath and punishment. That's what we do. We attach it to wrath and punishment because we get confused. Like even in this passage of scripture, Jesus does talk about something that's going to happen in Jerusalem, which isn't, which isn't nice, right? He talks about, hey, poor Jerusalem. Man, there's going to be a day when your enemies surround you and they're not going to leave one stone upon another. But it's not him delivering that to them. Do you read the passage of Scripture? He says, it's your enemies that are going to deliver that to you. I'm not your enemy. I mean, what's going to happen is the, the natural response to, to rejecting the creator, the very cornerstone of foundation of, of creation is that your enemies run amok over you. The enemy of your brokenness. The enemy of your worries. The enemy of chasing after the wrong things. The enemy of the lack of peace. The enemy of your anxieties. You are already on the wide road that leads to destruction. And you don't recognize I'm here. No, no, you know what the time of God's coming is? I mean, I mean honestly, all throughout the scripture, all throughout the Old Testament, every time the phrase shows up, the time of God's coming, it's not a time of punishment or a time of wrath. It's not a time of the end. It's a time of the beginnings of things. In the Old Testament, the time of God coming was about redemption and salvation. It was about rescue and hope. It was about freedom and life. That's the time of God's coming, and the evidence is there all through the Old Testament. Like the time of God's coming with the Exodus, right? I mean, man, in Exodus, the time of God's coming was he set him free from the slavery of, of, of Egypt. In Ruth, the time of God's coming was he delivered a harvest for them so they would not starve to death. For Hannah, the time of God's coming was he, was he, was he did away with her barren womb and she was able to give birth to Samuel. The time of God's coming in Zechariah is when there were real enemies pushing down upon them and he saved them from their destructive forces. I mean, Jesus didn't show up to bring destruction. That's not what he showed up for. He showed up to bring grace and mercy and help and hope. 
and it clearly breaks his heart that they don't recognize the moment when he shows up in Jerusalem and he's heading to the cross and he's about ready to, uh, to, to give his own life to pay the penalty for all of their wrongdoing and sin. All of creation recognizes him. They know who he is, but Jerusalem and the people do not recognize him. Do you? Do you recognize him? Do you recognize the weightiness of even this moment? I mean, do you recognize the weightiness of it? Do you recognize the weightiness of the moment? when the body of believers gather together in worship? Do you recognize the weightiness of it? That Sunday morning after Sunday morning after Sunday morning, we gather together in the most significant moment of your life. Do you recognize that? I mean, do you see that? Where two or three are gathered, I'm there. I am right there. I am on it. Do you, do you recognize that? The weightiness of the purf, purf, purposeful gathering of believers. Do you recognize the weightiness of the moment when you're full of anxiety? And you're stressed and you're pacing around and you're asking the question, where are you? Do you recognize the weightiness of the moment? When you look out your window and, and you see all of creation, do you hear it crying out of the very existence of God? Do you recognize the weightiness of the moment? And do you recognize that that moment is about your redemption? That moment is about your rescue. That moment is about your help. That moment is filled with hope. The time of God's coming. Do you want to know when the time of God's coming is in your life? You want to know when the time of God's coming into your life? I'll tell you when it is. You know what the time of God's coming in your life is? Every moment, every moment carries this powerful weight because he is ever present. And do we, do we get the weightiness of the moment? And, and what do we do with that? What do we do with the weight of that moment? Oh, man. We practice his presence. That's something I've been trying to like, I've been trying to roll that out in my life more and more and more, wherever I am, whatever the time is, whatever's taking place, that I am, that I am practicing his presence. Right? That when, when something happens, it hits me the wrong way and my, and my anger would start to well up within me. I, I got to practice his presence, right? I'm watching a rerun of the Ohio State-Georgia playoff game from two years ago last night. I can't figure out how Ohio State lost that game. I'm watching it and literally like my stomach is starting to turn and I'm starting to get nervous and upset about it. I'm like, that was two years ago. That's over, right? And I'm like, whew, wait a minute. Why am I getting worked up? Uh, the, in the realm of things that matter, right, that's like way, 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 way down the scale of the realm of things that matter. Even though I do believe that God is a, well, you don't need to say that, but are, are you with me? 
Like Jesus is looking at Jerusalem and he's like, man, I'm here. And you're so confused. And you're so broken. And you're so wrapped up in the deceitfulness of wealth and you're, you're so full of anxiety and you're so full of, you're missing me. The answer to it all, you're missing me. Man, can I, can I encourage you? Don't miss him. Don't miss this moment. Whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is that's on your mind, whatever is worrying you, whatever you're deceived by, man, this would be a great time to just say, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm giving this all to you. I am not going to miss this moment. I am going to declare who you are and I'm going to sing your praises. I'm going to embrace you. I'm not going to think about all these other things that would distract me or that would draw me away or that I'm not happy about. You know what I'm going to worry about? I'm not going to seek a location. I'm not going to seek a vacation. I'm not going to seek a, uh, another paycheck. I'm going to seek you. That's what I'm going to seek. Day after day and moment by moment. I'm going to seek you. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to understand the weight of each moment of my life. Jesus, I praise you and I thank you for your goodness and your grace. I praise you for how much you care about us. Now, Jesus, some of us here this morning, we do have a brokenness that makes it hard for us to acknowledge you. We fight against the truth of who it is that you are. And Jesus, I just pray that you would overwhelm us. Just overwhelm us. Just just help us in creation itself to see how it shouts of your invisible qualities. And Lord, draw us ever so close to you. We're dependent upon you, Lord. We acknowledge you. We acknowledge you as the Lord of our lives. Now, Jesus, work and move in our hearts and our minds. Help us to take the steps that we need to, Lord, the next steps in our lives to follow even more passionately after you. And Jesus, in response to your goodness and grace, in response to your great love and in obedience to your command, we bring what it is that you ask us to bring. We bring our tithes and our offerings. Now, we get it, Jesus. We know that you don't need our tithes and our offerings. We get that, right? I mean, the streets upon which you walk are gold. You own a cattle on a thousand hillsides. You don't need what it is we bring. But, Jesus, we desperately need to bring it. We need to bring it for obedience to you and for unwrapping the deceitfulness of wealth even in our own lives. We cannot serve both you and money. So, Lord, you say, bring unto me. And, Lord, receive what we bring today as a testimony that you are the provider of all things. And together, we join with you in what you desire to accomplish in this world. We love you, Jesus. Receive what it is we bring. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot out of it. If you feel like you need to respond, you can visit fairviewvillagechurch.com slash prayer and you can fill out the forms there and let us know how we can be praying for you. Or you can scan the QR code below and that'll take you everywhere you need to go for next steps. Thanks so much for joining. We hope you have a great week and looking forward to connecting with you.